And the second one is, de deals with what is also implied as nuclear terrorism. Yeah. Um, and I assume you've never had any personal contact with either one of these, uh, these subjects. We're so not. how do you familiarize yourself with, uh, with the, uh, the details, the nitty gritty of, of these topics? Well, uh, maybe we should talk a little bit about the second one because um, actually that takes partly uh, place in, in Hungary too. Um, yes. Um, we, well, there were two beginning points to this story. One was that um, there was a, a my, we, we caught a small um, article, barely even an article really, um, uh, on a place in Copenhagen, uh, an old, I think it was an old uh, auto repair shop or something um, that the police had had to clear because there were about ne nearly 100 people living there with uh, hopelessly inadequate uh, sanitary facilities and so on, and um, you know sleeping on floors and so on, and and sh all these people sharing just one loo or something like that. Um, and they were all coming from Eastern Europe. Um, some were Romanian, some were Hungarian. And they were pretty much all Roma. Um, and uh, the, the story in the paper was really, you know, graphic pictures about the filthy conditions and all of that, and, and, and sort of how can, any, how can human beings live like that? And we thought, well, we started thinking, well, how can people live like that? Why do they choose to do so? Why do they come here and pay uh, ridiculous sums for such substandard accommodation? What is it that drives them and where do they come from? So that was, that was part of the, uh, uh, the impetus for that one. Um, and also uh, the, the other half was we, we were lucky enough to have, uh, we are lucky enough to have a good source in the former operative chief of Danish intelligence. Um, oh. And, um, and we talked to him a little bit, um, and we knew that there was a lot of concern about radioactive material floating around and coming out of the, um, the eastern countries uh, when the war went down, and that we knew that certainly not all of that had been accounted for. And, um, and we thought, well, we don't really want someone to just find an unexploded atomic bomb or something like that. Um, but there are other ways in which um, radioactive material can be spread. And there, there was an incident in um, Brazil uh, a number of years ago where um, in the ruins of an old hospital, someone had found um, uh, what used to be inside the, um, an apparatus for radiation treatment. And, um, and they, they'd cracked it open. Uh, and got at the um, radioactive material, um, and it had, uh, and it because it was it was a little bit like the glow powder they used in carnivals and so on. Someone had actually sort of smeared it on their skin and brought it home and showed it to their neighbors and so on. And about 120 people got really ill with radiation sickness, and four of them died. Um, so we used that because how do you? When we talk, try to talk to um, uh, people who knew about these things, um, how do you know uh, exactly how quickly something like that would spread and how lethal it would be? And because actually the answer is it's less lethal than you'd think. I mean, a lot of people have come into contact with this. And yes, they did get sick, uh, but only four people died. Um, so basically, we thought, well, all right, we'll take that. We'll uh, we'll have some uh, some young Romas, uh, a little bored, uh, uh, breaking into an abandoned uh, military hospital in Hungary, uh, and suddenly there's there's been a bit of an earthquake. Uh, not now, don't worry. <laughs> um, uh, and um, so so uh, the basement that has been sealed off since the Soviets left. Um, has now has a, a part of the um, uh, part of the floor has collapsed so that you can now get into the basement that which you couldn't before, and they find something like that, and that's the, the whole start of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking too much. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, so he, he ultimately, 
your novels about Nina, <clears throat> Nina Borg are, are based and uh, it's grounded in some fact and yeah, some, yeah. some something that actually has happened. Yeah. Uh, Kati, is that the, is the same true of, of your novels? Or are they just works of imagination? Uh, they are, I, I would say, like 98% of work of imagination. But they could have happened, I would say. Like in, in uh, The Hummingbird, one of the main themes was the honor-related violence in, in Kurdish community in Finland. And it happens, but, but I didn't... Like I didn't research like real, real things for that book. I I used my imagination. I actually I don't my, much like to do research. I do it only that much that I have to do. But I was just talking with someone that nowadays like everybody can Google everything. It's I don't want to put too many like real facts like din 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 because it's. I find it somehow very boring, and it's also um, bounding my my imagination if I do it like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, there are murders in in Hummingbird. Naturally, there are uh, joggers get shot by shotgun when they are jogging in a remote jogging bath, and. That was from the idea, because I, I'm a hunter myself, I have two shotguns, and I was many times thinking that if I would shoot someone, if, if I <laughs> would need to, <laughs> need to shoot someone, I would use shotgun rather than, <laughs> rather than um, for example, pistol or rifle or whatever, because you cannot trace shotgun. You cannot say that this, this um, uh, bullet, or they are not bullets, but anyway, I don't know the word in English, what's you, what is the thing you put in the Hardish. shotgun? Hardish. But anyway, you, you cannot say that it came from this certain weapon. But with rifle and other types of weapons, you can do it. So the shotgun is perfect. It's lo very noisy, but if the murder happens to take place when the time is, like, when the hunting season starts, in remote North Finland, you, there is nothing else you can hear for a couple of days, like bang, 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 everybody's shooting ducks, so you can shoot somebody <laughs> there too. Okay, well, we don't want that to happen. Yeah. I think I've read somewhere that Finland is one of the, uh, the countries in the world that has almost as many uh, firearms per capita as the United oh, States. Oh yes, we do. Yeah. I think it <laughs> might be even more. I, I yeah. actually have the actual yeah. amount yeah. of the weapons in the book. I don't remember it yeah. anymore, but it's it's huge. Mm. But they are all all legal guns, and they are most of them, like almost hundred percent of them, are for hunting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there are not actually not not any accidents. Maybe sometimes something, but really, really low accident no, rate. No no, 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 no. It's it's usually hunting rifles and hunting shotguns. This, these are the weapons we have. <laughs> I, I want to uh, I want to move uh, as quickly as possible to uh, uh, give the audience a chance to ask their questions. But I have one last question of all four of you before I, I do that. Um, what was your inspiration for writing? crime novels. Uh, is that, do you have a model? Is there some writer who uh, you felt was uh, uh, inspiring to you? Jürgen? Uh, well, uh, as you said, I was working as a journalist when, uh, when I started writing novels. Uh, I was actually writing uh, historical articles, you know, popular history. And uh, I, uh, I've always been very interested in history, uh, so the, the subject of you know history, and um, for me it was uh, uh, it started with the historical uh, the historical um, matters uh, which I was working on. It was actually supposed to be an article about uh, autopsy and the history of ah. autopsy, uh, but then I started working on it and I found you know this could be maybe a, a good novel. I didn't think crime novel at the time. Um, but there's something about crime fiction and the, the, the uh, and and the history that you know and uh, and uh, uh, a historian. Uh, I mean, uh, 
uh, uh, what, what do you call it when you're working as a historian? Is that, yeah. mm -hmm. he, would, uh, he, he would, you know, go into the sources and do investigations, and uh, he would, uh, you, know, uh, you know, try to uh, reconstruct what really happened. And that's a lot of what the detective do in crime fiction as well. Yes, you have the course. murder, you have the murder, and then you have the time before the murder, and then you have the time after the murder, and you have some some of the same structure as in history. And uh, the huh. uh, and I found that you know to be interesting, and that's why I wanted to to do a crime fiction eventually. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, I mean, if you're working with autopsy and you're uh, kind uh, trying to figure out murder methods. I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, always interesting. So, I mean, uh, there's uh, some very interesting murder methods in my first books. <laughs> uh -huh. Absolutely. So it was history that led you to writing crime fiction. Yeah, not I would Not say reading that. some other author's work. Well, I, I, of course, I've, uh, I've read a, a lot of crime fiction myself, but it, it was history, yeah. I yeah. would say that. Okay. Yeah. Kati, what about you? Has there been any author who's been uh, inspiring to you? I've been is inspired by many, many authors, like not only crime authors, but I, I'm a big, big reader. But the crime fiction to me, I think it was, it was kind of accident, like a accident child, but very beloved one afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> the thing to me is that I want to write and that writing is my passion. That is what I want to do. It happens to be crime. I don't know why. It just it was just an idea at first, and then it took me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Agnete? Well, um, I read a lot, a lot of crime fiction, especially when I was a child. So I would say very basic. Um, Agatha Christie and, uh, well... All the crime fiction, I, well, Cheval and, and Valu, the Swedish writers that are men mentioned, um, probably would be the the way my interest got started. Uh -huh. yeah. But that we came to write crime fiction was actually quite accidental, and it's still we tend to get really interested in the characters and then you know, and building the plot and so on. And then at some point we 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 sometimes stop and say, "Have we murdered anyone yet?" <laughs> And we have actually, with, with a couple of our books, gone all the way through, and it's entirely debatable whether a murder actually took place when you go back and look at it. Mm. A crime certainly took place, and, and, and there was violence and, and, and criminal events, but it doesn't, I mean, even, I mean, the first book, um, the, the, the very first scene in the, very, in the first book is uh, a woman opening this suitcase and, and finding, um, the boy inside, I mean, he, he's been left in a luggage locker at Copenhagen Central Station like he was luggage, so much luggage, or, and, and folded up inside this suitcase. Um, but the point is, he's still alive. So it starts off not with someone finding a body, but mm -hmm. finding someone who is actually still alive. And because our protagonist is a Red Cross nurse with the obsession I mentioned, she doesn't actually, she's actually quite a difficult detective to work with. I mean, she's, I suppose she's technically an amateur sleuth, but she's not interested in finding out who did it. She doesn't care who did it. All she cares about is rescuing something or somebody from, from the ruins. Uh, that's her motivation. Um, so eventually we had to, when we came to the second book, we had to invent, uh, invent a, a police character simply because uh, she, she didn't. She didn't want to investigate. Didn't uh -huh. care to investigate. So we needed someone who desperately had that as his drive. Um, I was wondering about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, also, yeah. I mean, with the first one, we didn't have. Uh, we didn't know much about police procedure apart from. I mean, Anita obviously had some insights because of her uh, job at the the crime desk of a of a local newspaper, but. We didn't really know enough to write a police procedural, and we uh, we were aware of that. Oh, and we didn't care either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, that's part of that's that's part yeah. of the problem because when you when you get to the procedural stuff, basically, usually what happens is that Anita says, "I get really bored writing that stuff," and I go, "Okay, all right, I'll do it." <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Can you hear me up there in the back? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's. Uh, I'm going to dispense with the microphone then. 
Let's open this up to questions. And I'm going to stand a little bit forward so that I can actually see you if I do this. So, question. So would you be willing to share your opinion of American mystery and crime writing? And do you have any particular favorites? Ooh, would we be willing to share our uh, opinion on um, American crime writing? I mean, that's a huge field you're asking us to have an opinion on, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I've, I've been very inspired by um, people uh, like uh, Sarah Paretsky. Uh, she, I think she writes a mean detective novel, and I love her, her main character. Um, I think on the whole... Uh, I find that American, the American tradition is much more about the lone investigator, the, the, the very private eye, it, even in the sense that, that it's quite often a first-person narrative. And what we've found is that peop, we, we write multiple uh, points of view, and we've actually found that that seems to be a barrier for some uh, American readers. I'm wondering whether it's because then they haven't really been trained uh, in multiple points of view. Uh, uh, but um, apart from that, I don't think I have much to offer. Well, uh, uh, the, the, I've read a lot of the, you know, the, um, the classics, the old, uh, like Raymond Chandler and uh, Hammett, from, you know, yeah. Mm. Uh, and of course, that Edgar Allan Poe, uh, which is way back, but, you know, that's part of the tradition as well. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think uh, we have to be honest to say that American crime fiction is, a, in, as, is an inspiration to all of us. But it always, it doesn't always come in um, in books. It comes in, you know, all the shows, the, you know, the, the series that that we can, you know, most of them, you know, view in in uh, Scandinavia as well. So I mean, we're kind of surrounded by it and. Maybe we take it a little bit for granted, you know. Uh, it's like, you know, really good crime shows, they come from the United States. So, but, uh, and I, but I do agree with Elena, you know, in the, uh, the thoughts she had about, you know, the first person narrative and I think, even though it's not always the first person narrative, the, the, I mean, the, the individual is very important in, in American crime fiction. Mm. And the, the status of the individual is kind of, you know. Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, I won't analyze the differences between American and Nordic crime or anything like that. And I won't even mention any, no, I could mention maybe Raymond Chandler too. But there are two, yeah, <laughs> two American writers that have really, really inspired and influenced me. I love their books. They are not crime writers. They are Toni Morrison and Annie Proulx. Absolutely fantastic literature. Well, uh, well, of recent things, I really enjoyed Gillian Flynn. And uh, that's because I think but that's interesting, I think, to us when we're writing uh, that the, uh, some crimes tend to go cross genre now. They sort of uh, they they blend into the the, the novel, and uh, I think Gillian Flynn is a good example of how it's a crime fiction, but it's not really crime fiction. And uh, yeah, so and it's also an example of multiple uh, viewpoints. Oh in, yeah, in a, and a very yeah. clever use yeah. of them too. Yes, yeah. exactly. I would just like to know if you have difficulty getting your books translated into English. Because I have a friend of mine who's uh, Danish. She comes back from travels with all of these books, and she's raving, raving, except they're all written in Danish. So I was just wondering if you have difficulty getting them translated into English, or is it a given that it'll come? Well, Could you hear that up in the back? Yeah. Yes. Well. Um, there has been such a demand, I think, for Scandinavian uh, crime fiction that we actually do have to sort of wait in line for the translators to uh, to have time to, to for our books. But in our particular case, we've been very uh, I've been lucky, and she's been very good because she actually translated our first novel into English. And um, but but otherwise, yes, it's a it is a 
problem because there are just not enough um, qualified um, translators and and the um, the quality varies a lot. Uh, I think yes. also translators are underpaid and undervalued, which doesn't help. It's uh, Stephen Murray. Yeah, it's it's uh, he's the translator for all my books. He's actually now finished the third one, so there's another Old Things Circuit coming out this winter. So that's good. Uh, but it's, it's Stephen Murray. He's a real good uh, translator. I think he translated the Millennium series for Stieg Larsson. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Mm. So I'm lucky to have him. <laughs> That's what I think is really interesting. <laughs> yes. Well, we thought at first that we would have to rewrite each other's chapters in order to blend the voices. Um, but we found actually probably because we'd been talking up a storm for so long that we'd somehow actually managed to find a voice that is distinctly coable and free and not how we would write individually. Actually, our editor has never been able to tell which one wrote which chapters. Well, until oh, yes. we were a bit rushed with the final one, and I had to turn in. I had to. Because we had to turn it. Comments. We had to turn it in before I had. I had time to uh, do the commas in our needless bits. I have comma dyslexia, so yes. that's a that's. And a, that's, that's a real disease. So, I yeah. finally come to realize that that she really can't help it. I mean, in the beginning, I couldn't understand it. I mean, she's an intelligent woman. Uh, <laughs> She should be able to learn how to do it. I just didn't understand. But she really, 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 I mean, she's capable of inserting a comma between the subject and the, and, and the verb. No problem. But I'm, I'm working on it. But, yeah. but any, but any I, comma, am working on it. Yeah. <laughs> True. But anyway, the, the point is, of course, we, we find that there are problems in each other's chapters. But basically, we, we point them out to the person who actually wrote the chapter and then ask the person to fix it. So, so each chapter is written, finished by yeah. the person who you get started to writing. You get to fix your own mistakes once you've uh, exactly. actually agreed that there might have been a mistake. Yes. <laughs> I've read Scandinavian mysteries, but I've, most of my experience is through TV and movie adaptations. And based on that, it's amazing anyone's alive in Scandinavia. <laughs> <laughs> what, what also impresses me is the gruesomeness. They seem to be more gruesome than the murders that we get in American mysteries. Any comment on that? Um, Karen Slaughter. Yeah. I rest my case. <laughs> yeah. John Sanford. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but I think you have a point, maybe. Uh, I mean, I'm uh, talking about my first book. You have uh, quite gruesome murders there, but uh, I was, uh, that was you know, sort of my plan when I wrote that book. To, you know, as I said, uh, I wanted to write uh, you know, also about the, the tra tradition and the history of Oh, crime fiction. So I wanted the murders to be kind of gruesome and brutal because of that. And uh, I think uh, it also, I mean, I think it has something to do with what uh, we were talking about when we started, about, you know, the, the, the Norwegian and Swedish and Danish societies, Finnish, uh, are really, you know, tranquil and peaceful societies. And, you know, the contrast between, you know, the really gruesome murders and the, and the and peacefulness is, uh, is a very effective contrast, I think, so, uh, in a literary way. Mm. Can I just say okay? Because also, I think I believe there is a trend that that it's it's a getting to be more and more violent, and, and I think basically I think it's just because you want to uh, well make stuff even better, or perfectionize uh, something. Okay, I've made this type of murder. I want to make it even more. Uh, it's not um, it's not a trend that that we. Uh, <laughs> Buy into because we really uh, don't like the the very 
very graphic. Explicit graphic yeah. violence. Yeah. And uh, personally, I don't find it necessary to make a good story. Uh, and I really don't enjoy reading books uh, with that kind of graphic violence. So it's just. I think, yeah. I think it also says something about the way the author sees his audience. If he thinks that's why they read his, his or her books, I think that that's a very uh, depressing way, really, of thinking of your reader. Ooh, I'd better make it a little bit grimmer and worse and more horrible uh, because that way they'll like me more. Um, uh, I don't think, I mean, I, I said earlier that I think that, that, that Nordic fiction to a certain extent is more why done it than who done it. But I really don't want it to turn into how done it. Uh, I mean, that, that, that really the, the intrigue of the story is all about just exactly how utterly painful and 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 horrible this murder was. Uh, in fact, okay. Well, um, I think that as an author, if you want to uh, do your job well, you have to ha have a very good reason for why as to why you're doing. Why uh, why are you putting precisely precisely this in your book? And one of our very uh, good friends and colleagues in Denmark had her uh, some of her books uh, um, made into movies. And the movies was just, oh, they were completely splattered with blood everywhere. And she was asked why, uh, why it was like that. And she couldn't really answer, except she said, okay, this is sort of what we feel uh, the, the audience wants now. And that's just, to me, that's not a good enough reason. Uh -huh. So I, yeah, so I think you can absolutely make graphic violence and make it beautifully and and well and art uh, with with the aesthetically. Yeah, but the uh, point is, to me, there has to be a very good reason why you would use that specific tool I mean, to it's, tell your story. It's so dead. It's dead yeah, easy I to grow someone out. All you have to do is explain exactly how it feels and smells and and and. I mean, if you uh, um, just poke a screwdriver through someone's eyeball, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's easy, but it's not interesting. I don't like to write uh, very detailed illustrations of violence. Like, I don't find it interesting and I don't find it important also. I, I rather, there, there is violence, but uh, I leave the reader to, to imagine it, what, what, how it happened, actually. I don't, I don't like to... Give, give all the details, and also I'm more interested to to explore the conse consequences of violence. Yeah. What happens after? Yeah. So the family of the victim, or or whatever. Uh, I have to. Uh, I think uh, you know um, the thing about violence in literature. We have to remember remember it is literature. So you know it's. Um, and I think maybe people uh, sort of tend to forget that, and they stop reading and interpreting when it, you know, when it becomes too violent. Uh, there was a uh, there was a, a story a book which came out in the 1500s in the, in Italy in Napoli uh, called the uh, called the uh, Pentameron, which is uh, and it has the undertitle Stories for Children. And it's you know one <laughs> one of the most uh, bloody books that maybe has been written. It's uh, uh, there's uh, one story there about a woman who wants to, uh, who flays herself because she doesn't like uh, she's an old woman and she's wrinkled and she doesn't like her skin so she flays herself. Uh, and it's you know very graphic, uh, but still I mean there's a literary interpretation in it and it. I mean, it's valid even today, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, making your face be more beautiful, you know, the uh, plastic surgery and stuff like that. And it, uh, even though there was a nose job done in the 1500s in Italy, they didn't really, you know, have those uh, references then. But uh, with new references, the story is still valid and it, it still lives, you know. And that's the, you know, the beauty of literature, you know. and. I think uh, even though, I mean, you find things in the, the book that disturbs you, you should, uh, as a reader, still read it in a literary way, uh, try to interpret it. 
but I, I do agree with you know the other uh, orders there. Some writers just put violence in the book for the sake of violence, and then it's not you know uh, effect, eff effective, or it doesn't work the way it should. Uh, you have to have a thought about how, why are you doing this, and what does it mean? Is it a metaphor, or you know what uh, what 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 does it do in your book? Mm. Yes. I can speak uh, just about Norway in this reference, but I know that the governments have been somewhat restrictive in how much violence you get to see in those countries via TV yeah, and right. music and other things that they've been pretty restrictive of. Do you think the genre has grown from that kind of restriction? It makes you a little more just expressive? The, the question is about Norway, where the government has uh, limited the amount of, of violence that, that can be uh, depicted, can be reported. I yeah, think. that's right. Well, uh, you know, they're lightening up now, but uh, it's uh, it has changed a lot in the last ten years. But yeah, eighties is the right uh, period to, <laughs> to pick your. E.T. was not allowed to be shown because of the violence in Norway. Or the e violence in the movie. No, uh, it, it it was shown, but I think it has it was cut, cut. Yeah, some scenes were cut, uh, and uh, there's a lot of examples examples of that. And uh, Norway is uh, I don't know about Finland, but I think uh, Denmark and Sweden was, were were more liberal when it came to. I uh, myself uh, live, uh, lived when I was a young kid uh, close to the border of Sweden, so we could go to Sweden and see, see, <laughs> For the know, hard see, stuff. see, see all the stuff, <laughs> yeah, see the violence, <laughs> and even uh, yeah. <laughs> And look uh, what happened. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> look what happened. So, uh, but it's an interesting point, you know. Is it, you know, kind of because it has been held down? Is it now flourishing? Uh, maybe I don't know. But it's 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 an interesting point. Mm. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, excuse me if my question goes on for a while, but. Um, I had enough the opportunity to uh, visit uh, Sweden and D uh, Denmark uh, last year, and in speaking with many of the people, and also you know, reading about these countries, there is an unusually high uh, trust in institutions in all the Nordic countries. And um, uh, someone I met uh, from Sweden told me an interesting story of how um, a bus of Swedes and Finns had driven close to the Russian border, and when a Russian guard um, came and just demanded some money from them because of unspecified uh, laws, they just paid up because obviously why would uh, an uh, official of the government ask for money? To, uh, and uh, on the other hand, in uh, Nordic noir uh, fiction in general, uh, we see institutions are infiltrated by neo-Nazis and KGB agents and members of the mafia. So uh, has any of you used your fiction in a way to um, warn your fellow citizens to not be blindly believing in uh, institutions, because they can fail. I mean, as Lena, you pointed out with the um, refugee children in uh, the uh, orphanage, that if not for the some of the citizens themselves, but for some of their uh, less privileged uh, members of society who they can see, that you shouldn't always trust uh, what's happening. Um, well, uh in the Nordic countries, I think we have the, the least degree of um, corruption. corruption. And we have a very high degree of trusting each other. So basically, if you meet someone on the street, you would uh, automatically assume that that person will do you well. Uh, it's probably one thing. It's given as one of the reasons why we uh, continually make it to the top of the happiest country <laughs> in the world lists. Yeah. But of course... Um, uh, we, I think we have a very good example uh, in Denmark uh, some time ago. We had um, uh, one of the very big um, uh, public uh, companies, companies. Uh, of electricity was sold to uh, Goldman Sachs. Yes, and I'm sorry, but um, I think we had better just spell it here because otherwise it, it ends up sounding sort of really wrong because yeah. it's spelled D-O-N-G. Yes. And, um, and nobody think nobody in Denmark thinks that's funny. No, <laughs> that was the, the, there was a huge controversy about that because uh, a lot of people thought that it was be, uh, was being sold to um, 
to look for for a for too a ridiculously low price. low price. And afterwards, you found out that one of our ministers had actually gotten some sort of seat or position in the uh, on the board on the board and another position in somewhere else, and probably have benefited hugely personally from from this deal. And uh, to uh, Danes, at least, that that's a very foreign th thought. So of course. To, uh, you have to imagine that it's unthinkable for a Dane, but of course it happens. And so we shouldn't be blind about, of course, there can go things wrong within the system. So yeah, definitely, I think it's a, it's a good point that, that uh, we have to think the unthinkable, even though we have that. I think yeah. we also do deliberately try to puncture the smugness. Yeah. yeah. Um, because uh, you can get so uh, complacent about the... Um, I mean, and I think this is this is not only a Danish disease. It's also very much, for instance, a Swedish disease. We think we've got the best societies in the world, basically, um, and we get we can get quite smug about that. But arrogant. yeah, and there's an arrogance that goes with that that is not helpful. And uh, and so yes, we do sometimes deliberately go after that. Mm. I think we we do have corruption and we do have a rotten system also. But it's it's I think it's very well hidden in these countries, it, and also because people trust so much into these institutions, we don't look at it that way, that we would see what's really actually happening there, because there is happening a lot of, lot of bad things. But not but, as much probably. No, not that much probably, but like for example, it's, there were like many, many Finnish politicians and, and whatever who now, it was re re revealed that they used state money and put them into Panama bank mm -hmm. accounts and whatever, it's, it's, it's there. We're, we're running out of time. We may have time for one more quick question. <laughs> no diatribes, <laughs> no speeches. But Don't feel bad, we liked your question. <laughs> quick question, anybody? Yes, Ruby. Um, this time, a political question, uh, given how great the governments are and, you know... We've never, I don't think we ever said the governments were great. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't understand it pretty much. We didn't what, what's your opinion of the, the state of things now that there's been a huge influx of immigrants? Ah, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how has it, uh, what do we think of uh, the, the huge influx of immigrants and the the problems that's yeah. created, particularly our country's response to it. Um, ooh, it's actually more or less, um, it's become a thing with Danish cultural personalities when they go abroad, they have to sort of stand up and say, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed to be Danish, I'm ashamed of what we do. Um, and, and then they get criticized at home because they're, they're out there to, I mean, probably with Danish money, they've been sent to this foreign country and then they're doing down their country. But yes, I, I think it is a, I think what we are doing at the moment is shameful, um, and I think it's wrong. Well, uh, if I, oh, sorry. No, okay. go ahead. Um, I, I don't feel this, the same way as Lena on, on this one. I think uh, the situation is unusual uh, with this many people f uh, going to our country, and the Scandinavian countries um, are very popular <laughs> among refugees because once you get in, you get your uh, citizenship or your... Uh, Well, the equivalent of a green yes. card. Yeah. Then you have you automatically have access to, uh, as I said, free healthcare, free schools. Uh, you can go to university for free. You can sort of set up uh, an entire life, and it's it's so it's hugely expensive. And um, for uh, for the countries to sort of deal with, okay, we've set up this completely secure internet uh, net for our uh, citizens. How many can we bring inside that circle without it collapsing? And so it's um, it's a discussion you have to sort of be open to. And I think one of the Danish government has chosen as one of the things to make it very unpleasant to be a refugee in Denmark. And that's only because they, then they hope that the refugee will, refugees will flock to another country. <laughs> and and it's because we don't have any. Uh, um, effective way to sort of distribute the, the refugees. 
And so, so it is a real problem, and I can completely understand why, why, why people are getting a little afraid about what is happening, because uh, as it is now, we, we had the, um, uh, about 100,000 people coming in, uh, well, last year and this year combined, with their families um, having the right to come. So it's a total of 100,000 people, and we're a country of uh, 6 million. And um, yeah, people, uh, th those are people who are having uh, trouble. They don't know any Danish. They have a completely different culture. So it is a problem. And yeah, I don't know what to say. It's just difficult. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think there's, I don't think there's, oh, no, no I bet we had better not start discussing this amongst <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> Uh, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think the thing to, to remember is, uh, you know, you have both sides in uh, the Scandinavian countries as well. You have the ones who are skeptic to immigration and Im immigrants, and then you have the ones who, who, uh, who are more open to them. And I, I guess I'm one of those. Uh, I think uh, we're on the, as you said, uh, initially here, uh, 27 million people in in a quite large area, rich area. Uh, rich in uh, you know natural resources and in uh, in uh, education and in culture and uh, i think uh, it w we we will only be more enriched if we can you know do this in the right way and you know uh, uh, welcome these people into our society i think we need them to grow uh, and to be a better society and they they come with their resources and they have a lot to offer us but uh, it's i think it's more a question of pacing you know you can't you can't do everything at once so you have to have restrictions and uh, as a sort of sort of you have to have a sort of control of how many who, who's coming and when they're coming and uh, so so this discussion you know flourish up when uh, when there's uh, like uh, last winter and you know in the, in the spring when there was uh, very many coming in. So, but I think it's uh, basically a good thing. I mean, you know. You know what Finland government did just a couple of weeks ago? We got this huge amount of refugees from Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran. Ever, you know everywhere. And now suddenly the Finnish government decided that the, these countries, when they when they go through their applications, the asylum applications, now these countries are safe. So they now they have a rule that they can send them back. Before these were considered not safe countries, but now when we have so many of these applications, we had to do something for this. Okay, let's make them safe on paper so we can send them back. And actually the defenseless is about that there is a, a asylum seeker from Pakistan who who didn't get asylum and in in uh, I will say I don't know this really these words are difficult to me in English but for Finnish people we have this Finnish foreign ministry advice for travelers where they say that for example Pakistan is extremely dangerous country don't go there and the same with Iraq Afghanistan Somalia Syria don't go there no Syria it was not in that list they, that that is not considered safe country but the others are so for Finnish people it's it's extremely dangerous but for these people who fled yeah. there for their lives it's safe they can be sent back <laughs> 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 <laughs>